Welcome to the Canadian edition of The Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Uh, you're sharing this unconditional love, this amazing grace and truth. Uh, it's just setting people free. And now here's Andrew. Hello and welcome to another Gospel Truth episode. Today I'm beginning my seventh week teaching verse by verse through the book of Hebrews. I actually have a living commentary that's a digital commentary. That's the reason I'm using my computers because, man, this thing is awesome. You can just put the cursor over a reference and instead of having to change and go to a different screen, it'll just automatically bring it up. You can put a cursor over the Greek or Hebrew word and it'll bring up all the definition. It'll go to footnotes. and So anyway, I'm using this because it's convenient. But we've taken the portion of my living commentary on over 27,000 verses and we've printed it out in this book. And during this series is the first time I've ever offered this. This is uh, 215 pages uh, that is basically this living commentary on every single verse in Hebrews printed out in book form. So we're offering that. We also have CDs, DVDs, and a USB that will have the audio and video from these exact programs on there, and we're making all of this available. Today, I encourage you to please get hold of it. You know, I've been teaching, as I said, for over six weeks now on this, and um, the book of Hebrews is just one of the most foundational books in the Bible, and yet I would say that the average Christian this is not your favorite book, and it's because our religious tradition makes the book of Hebrews of no effect. That's what Jesus said in Mark chapter 7. He says, your traditions and doctrines of men make the word of God of none effect. And we have religious traditions that are completely contrary to what it says in the book of Hebrews. So when the average Christian goes to reading Hebrews, they just don't relate to it because they're holding on to these traditions. And so the book of Hebrews is a book that we need to understand and we need to let go of those traditions and embrace things. Like some of the things that I've already said, I'm not going to go back and reteach it, but Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10 make it very clear that Jesus forgave us of all sin at one time. Not just forgiving us of sins up until the time we get born again and then every time you sin, you got to get that sin confessed and under the blood but one sacrifice uh, brought us eternal redemption and eternal inheritance forever. We are sanctified and perfected forever. And people just struggle with this because they look in the mirror and they think this isn't perfect. And, the, and so we think well, it's when we get to heaven that all these things are going to happen. The scripture says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, as Jesus is, not as he was or is going to be as he is, so are we in this world, not in the one to come. And people just say, well, I can't understand that. It's because it's not in our physical body that we're changed. It's not our mental, emotional part that's been changed. But in our spirit, we are complete in Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, that we are as he is. We were created in righteousness and true holiness, Ephesians 4, 24, and on and on and on. We could go with scriptures. It, if you don't understand the book of Hebrews, if it's not one of your favorite books, I can promise you, you're missing some of the very foundational things that are so important to us living a Christian life. So again, please get these materials. I'm now in Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 3. And of course, the whole book of Hebrews was to tra transition legalistic, law-minded Jews into the new covenant of faith and grace. And that's a radical transformation. And so there was radical things said. And the whole book is about going from law, where it's all based on performance, to where it's all based on faith in what Jesus did now. So the whole book of Hebrews is trying to get people out of this performance mentality where you have to earn something from God to where you just simply believe that Jesus has purchased it all and made it available and all we have to do is believe and receive. If you doubt, you do without. And so that's the whole, that's kind of a summary of the book of Hebrews. So in chapter 11, he's been making this point about faith is the only thing. 
that we can really use to relate to God. And so in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, he just starts listing all of these things about faith. So in verse 1, Hebrews 11, 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know, I spent an entire day on that last week. I hadn't got time to go back through this. But man, I've got dozens and dozens and dozens of series talking about faith and how faith works and things like that. And I could spend much more time on this than what I'm going to do. Actually, we have over 200,000 hours of free teaching material on our website. If you were to listen 24 hours a day, it would take you 22 years to go through all the free material that we have there. And then if you only listen eight hours a day, it'd take you 66 years to go through it. And most of that, or much of that, is all about faith and how it works. And so this is just a nearly inexhaustible subject. I've got a lot of material on that. But just for time's sake, I'm going to continue to move on. And instead of teaching just on all the different aspects of faith, we're going to focus on the people of faith that are used right here in Hebrews chapter 11. So in verse 2 it says, For by it the elders obtained a good report. I've already talked about that. Verse 3 it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And again, you could, I could go into so much more detail on every one of these verses, but this says through faith we understand. And then it talks about the creation of the world, but it's not limited to just you know evolution versus creation. You can't understand anything if you don't start with some faith in God. God is the source of everything. He's the source of all creation, contrary to what a lot of people are saying today, that this all happened by happenstance and that all of this complexity came out of infinite simplicity. Did you know that violates the second law of thermodynamics that says everything goes from a state of order to a state of disorder? If you leave something alone, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. If you put an arrangement of flowers up, I guarantee you, if you just laid flowers on this table, they aren't going to come together and make an arrangement. You can take an arrangement and you leave them and they will fall apart and uh, disperse. You cannot observe anything in nature where things go from simplicity to complexity. You can see things where they go from complexity to simplicity. That's one of the laws of nature that even the evolutionists say that they embrace, and yet the whole concept of evolution is based on a single cell somehow or another being struck by lightning. First of all, where did the single cell come from? Where did the primordial ooze come from? Where did the lightning come from? But even if you could believe that somehow or another those things just existed, it, it, you know, some kind of complexity comes out of single cell, and it just violates everything that we see. So anyway, my point is, I could spend more time on this, but through faith you understand. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2 says, The word preached unto them, talking about the children of Israel that came out of the land of Egypt, did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You've got to put faith in the Word of God. You've got to read the Word of God through the eyes of faith. You have to read it with your heart, not just your head. And I know that there's some people watching this right now that you don't even know why you're watching a Christian broadcast. You're skeptical and you're just sitting there thinking about it. You know, is any of this stuff true? But you're reading it through the eyes of unbelief. You haven't opened up your heart. You won't embrace this. You won't even give it a chance. And then you wonder why nothing's happening. This says you have to understand through faith. If you would just open up your heart and say, if there is any truth to the Word of God, if God exists, if these things that the Bible talks about are true, well then, God, I, my heart is open. Show me. And if you would approach the Word like that, I guarantee you God would, would speak to you big time. But if you approach it looking for problems and analyzing it and critical and not even open, to, you know, you've already got a prejudice and you are determined that this isn't true and I'm going to read it to prove it's not true. That's not the way you're supposed to approach the Word of God. Through faith we understand. Anyway, we could spend a lot more time on that. In verse 4 it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, 
and by it he being dead yet speaketh. You know, this is talking about Cain and Abel, the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis, right after Adam and Eve sinned and were driven out of the Garden of Eden. They had two sons, Abel and Cain, and Cain and Abel both brought a sacrifice to the Lord. Cain brought a grain offering out of the field because he was a farmer. Abel brought an animal and killed the animal and offered a blood sacrifice. And it says that God had respect unto Abel's offering, but he rejected Cain's offering. And when Cain saw that, he got mad. And God told him, says, why are you upset? Why are you mad? If you do what's right, won't you be accepted? But if you don't do what's right, sin lies at the door. And anyway, Cain got mad at Abel and killed him. The very first murder in the Bible happened right after the expulsion from the garden, after Cain and Abel were grown. The very first generation, Cain killed his brother Abel. And anyway, there is a lot. I've got an entire series on this entitled The True Nature of God that will deal with Cain and Abel and what happened right after the uh, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel were driven out of the garden. And I tell you, that is powerful. Again, there's so much more I could say about it. But let me just focus on this. Some people say that the reason that Cain's offering was rejected by God and Abel's was accepted was because Abel offered a blood sacrifice. And of course, in the Old Testament law, which happened 2,000 years later, you had to offer a blood sacrifice. And so they say that it was because Cain, it was the substance of what he offered. He didn't offer a blood sacrifice. But also under the Old Testament law, if you were a farmer, you were supposed to bring the first fruits as an offering to the Lord. I don't believe it was the material. It was not the substance that was the problem. It was the fact that Cain offered his sacrifice, who knows, maybe out of guilt or out of just obligation that he had to do it, but he wasn't doing it from a pure heart. There wasn't faith involved. This says specifically that by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. It wasn't the substance. It was the condition of the heart. You know, the Message Bible bears this out. Here's what it says, uh, the way it translated this verse. It says, By an act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice to God than Cain. It was what he believed, not what he brought, that made the difference. That's what God noticed and approved as righteous. After all these centuries, that belief continues to catch our notice. So again, it was the fact that it was the heart attitude. And this is something that is carried on throughout the entire Bible. Like for instance, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it talks about that if you have the, uh, you know, the faith of God so that you could move mountains, but you don't have the right heart attitude, a heart attitude of love, it profits you nothing. If you give all of your goods to feed the poor, or if you give your body to be burned, it profits you nothing if you don't do it motivated by love. So the motivation behind your actions is more important than your actions. Boy, this is something that we need to hear today because there are many, many people that are just going through the actions and they may go to church, they may pay their tithes, they may give a token, you know, Bible reading, and they may live a relatively holy life. But if you're doing it out of duress, if you're doing it because you're forced to do it, if you aren't doing it in faith, then it doesn't please God. I'm jumping just a little bit ahead, but if you go down to verse 6, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So it's not what you do so much as it is the attitude that you do it in. And if you take that, if you accept that as true, which is exactly what these verses are saying, well, then that also will explain how God can still use somebody that has problems in their life because their heart is right. They may really be messing up. They may make some major mistakes, such as Abraham. He's going to be one of the examples that we used. And Abraham did a number of things wrong. He got afraid that somebody was going to kill him to get to his wife because she was so beautiful. And so he allowed her to be taken into a harem. And it was only the intervention of God that kept the Pharaoh from having sexual relationships with his wife. That's not the right thing to do. He, he didn't do things perfectly. He didn't follow God perfectly. We're going to talk about that when he took Lot with him. But nonetheless, he had a heart of faith. And because of that faith, he's the only person in the Old Testament called the friend of God. 
And you can say the same thing about Moses. Moses actually killed a man thinking that he was doing God's will and because of it he had to flee from Egypt. That wasn't the right thing to do and yet Moses had faith and faith is what pleases God. And we can say the same thing about Noah and it just goes through and lists all of these people and nearly every person that God used in the Bible had major flaws in their life. Now that is not promoting and advocating you to live a sinful life. That's not what this is saying, but it's saying that God has never had anybody qualified working for Him yet. God uses us in spite of who we are and not because of who we are. And so again, going back to this verse, it wasn't the substance that made Abel's offering accepted and Cain's rejected. It was the heart attitude that caused the problem. And so the writer of Hebrews is bringing this out, that faith is what pleased God. From way back in the beginning, the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis, you can see that it was faith is what pleased God. In verse 5, it says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. This is from Genesis chapter 5. And verses 21 through 24. Let me just read this quickly. It says, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. Methuselah turned out to be the oldest living person recorded in biblical history. He lived to be 969 years old. And his father was Enoch. And then it says, Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all of the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So that's what this is referring to here in Hebrews chapter 11 when it says Enoch was translated. He didn't die. He just was taken up into the uh, presence of God. We don't know exactly. The scripture doesn't give a lot of detail. I heard one preacher talk about that. He walked with God and spent so much time with God. He got so close to God that one day as he was walking with God, the Lord just said, you're closer to my home than you are yours. Why don't you come home with me? And instead of him dying, he was just translated. The only other person that this ever happened to recorded in biblical history is Elijah, and that's over in 2 Kings chapter 2. And in verse 11, it says, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, this is talking about Elijah and Elisha, his successor, that they talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. You know, again, a point that I was making in just the previous couple of verses is that God's never had anybody qualified working for him yet. And even though Elijah was a mighty man of God and he called fire down out of heaven and he caused a revival to happen, Elijah got so depressed and discouraged that he ran away from Jezebel and God told him to go anoint his replacement. Elijah was not a perfect servant. And yet, he walked with God in such a way that he escaped death and he just was taken up into heaven by a whirlwind. So the only two people in Scripture that is mentioned that they never died, that they just went into heaven, was Enoch and Elijah. We see that Elijah had some major problems in his life and yet he still was translated and, and skipped death. We suspect that the same thing happened with Enoch. And you know, this gives a little bit more information here in Hebrews chapter 11. And the writer of Hebrews, this has to be like divine inspiration because there is nothing in the Old Testament scripture that tells you these things. And yet the writer of Hebrews said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that he was translated because before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Man, that is awesome. Uh, Enoch went around telling people, I please God. You know, I ministered in a church in uh, uh, Missouri one time, and there was about three or 400 people in this morning service. And I got up and I said, how many of you want to please God more than anything else? And did you know nearly every hand in the place went up? And then I said, now this next question is really important. I said, how many of you believe that you really please God? And did you know out of three to 400 people in that service, there was two hands that went up. And one was a little girl and a little boy. They were like 11 and 12 years old. 
out of 400 people, two kids believed that they pleased God. And yet all of them said that that's what they wanted. Did you know if this is your desire to please God, and yet if you think that you don't do it, well, then that's just a recipe for disappointment, discourage, discouragement, depression, things like that. What is it that pleases God? The next verse, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but in the next verse, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. See, most people think that the thing that pleases God is when we do everything right, when you're living holy and doing everything just right, then that'll please God. Then you have boldness to enter in. But Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, let us come boldly under the throne of grace, not the throne of judgment, not the throne of justice, but before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Not when you've done everything perfectly, but even when you've messed up. See, this is one of the things that the book of Hebrews has just been teaching over and over and over that we are accepted with God by what Jesus did. And the only thing that's demanded on our part is to believe and receive. We don't earn it. And this is the point that he's making right here, that Enoch was translated so that he didn't even taste death, not because he had done everything perfectly. We really don't have very much information about him, so we don't know all the details, but the writer of Hebrews, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said the reason he was translated and escaped death wasn't because he lived such a holy life, not because he did everything perfectly. It's because he had this testimony that he pleased God. And then the next verse says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. And so this is saying that he was walking by faith. This is not crediting his holy living as the reason that he was translated. It's talking about faith is the thing that caused this to happen. And he had this testimony that he pleased God. You know, I actually have taught on this before, and I had a woman give me a sweatshirt that had in big letters on it, I please God. <laughs> and did you know... I wore that a few times out in public and I got so much criticism. I had people come at me and saying things like, who do you think you are? Because again, the average person thinks that when you say, I please God, what you're saying is that I'm a holy person and that I'm doing everything right because they believe that God is pleased with us based on performance. But based on these scriptures, God is pleased with us based on faith. And if you've got faith in God, then that pleases Him. And it would be appropriate to say that I please God. But I actually quit wearing that shirt because I didn't have time to explain it to everybody. And I was having people get mad at me and misunderstanding it, things like that. But this is a great biblical truth that faith is what pleases God. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are pleasing to God, even though you may not be doing everything right, if you would just stand in that faith instead of in your performance. I'd been a Christian since a young age. I was married to a pastor. I was doing everything in the church. So why was I carrying this weight of guilt and fear and sadness in my heart? The antidepressants I took were only Band-Aids. I saw myself defeated stuck in religion, helpless, and with no way out. My world got worse when my husband was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I felt there had to be an answer. And you said the word would change you effortlessly from the inside out. So I became a student of the Word of God. I took notes on every topic Andrew taught and found I really didn't know God or His Word. And then one day, about two months later, when I took a deep breath, I realized that weight of defeat and condemnation and guilt I'd carried around for years was gone. My heart was filled with peace, and it really had been an effortless change. God's Word has an answer to everything in life. It does require spending time in the Word, but that time in the Word is priceless. Now I know him as my loving, faithful father. I tell you, that is awesome what God did for Connie. She's a friend of mine. She works in our partner relations and she spends her day calling partners and just ministering to them and loving on people. And she is just full of the joy of the Lord. And it's God's word that did that for her. 
You know, we are trying to reach many, many people just like Connie. And Caris Bible College is how we go deep and share this. We're in the process of building out our Caris Bible College. It's going to be a huge project. We encourage people to join with us. Go to awmi.net slash campus and you can see artist renderings of the building and you can sign up and become a monthly foundation builder with us. I know you would be blessed. Do you want to dive deeper into God's Word? Now you can with Andrew Womack's Living Commentary. I'd like to encourage you to get this Living Commentary. We call it a Living Commentary because I'm still writing it. And I've written footnotes on over 27,000 verses in the Bible. And I promise you, this is powerful. It's not only got my commentary and experiences and revelations that God has given me, but it's got Greek and Hebrew words defined. It's got references and just all kinds of things here. It would be a tremendous blessing to you. So check it out, our Living Commentary. The Living Commentary includes two dictionaries, four commentaries, and 12 versions of the Bible, plus atlases and biblical maps. Grow in the Word with Andrew's Living Commentary software. You can enjoy the Word of God wherever you are, on your phone, computer, or tablet. Download the Living Commentary today. I'd like to let all of you, our Canadian viewers, know that we have a Bible college in Toronto. And we would love to have you come and be a part of it. There's multiple ways you can take advantage, not only through the campus there in Toronto, but we have online courses, we have correspondence courses, uh, just a number of ways. But we want to help you, and we're making it as available to you as we possibly can. So check it out with the information's on your screen, our Carius Bible College, Toronto. If Andrew's teachings are making a difference in your life, consider becoming a Grace Partner with Andrew Womack Ministries Canada today. Go to awmc.ca or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220. Also, to learn more about the vision and mission of Andrew Womack Ministries Canada, be sure to visit our website at awmc.ca. While there, you'll also find details about all of the products available and be able to access many of Andrew's teachings absolutely free. Remember, that's awmc.ca. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to hearing from you today. Andrew is pleased to announce the release of his brand new book, Hebrews, Living in the New Covenant Reality. This hardback book includes all of Andrew's personal study notes and commentary on the book of Hebrews as compiled from Andrew's Living Commentary software. Discover the transformative truths of the book of Hebrews when you get Andrew's brand new book, Hebrews Living in the New Covenant Reality, today. Andrew's complete series, Hebrews Living in the New Covenant Reality, is available as a book, CD album, TV, DVD album, and USB made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources are available when you contact us. Or you can call the Andrew Womack Ministries Canada Helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220 to order. 